Cool. Um, this is Nathan with Town Hall Project, and with me is none other than Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon. Thank you so much Thanks. for uh, talking to me today. Thanks uh, for being here again. We so appreciate you guys looking constantly for grassroots government, and you sure saw it tonight. We did. Uh, this was your 950th town hall uh, since entering the Senate, which is, saying the words is kind of amazing. Um, a, congratulations. B, thank you on behalf of Oregonians and Americans for just making this a priority. Um, you know, we ask you similar questions all the time, but like, what keeps you going to meet your constituents so often? I think it is really more important now than at any point in my time in public service. It's pretty clear that there is a very high measure of polarization, that a lot of folks have just gone off in their separate camps. And what I try to do is, no matter who comes to the meeting, look at areas where there's an opportunity for common ground. Like tonight, for example, I wrapped up the meeting by talking about the bipartisan prescription drug bill that Senator Grassley, he is a Republican Iowa farmer, and I am an Oregon Democrat, Democratic Great Panther, and we defied the odds and came up with a bipartisan bill that if you use the numbers from AARP, basically you wouldn't have much of a drug pricing crisis. So I think it is especially important now to be accessible, to be accountable, to let people ask whatever questions they want, and try to give examples where even in a polarized time like this, you can defy the odds and get something done. That's great. So I don't want to set any expectations, but you are, based on our math, you're on pace to hit 1,000 sometime next year. Um, do you have any you know, big plans, where it's going to be, <laughs> what you're going to do, have a big cake? <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't really, I haven't really thought about that. I, I always think that the, the celebration is owed to all folks um, who, who, who come. I think today, and, and sometimes it really just resonates with me when I walk in, I feel that I'm looking out like at a crowd today on a hot night in Oregon in August. And a lot of things you could be doing besides educating me. And I'm looking out at a big crowd and I'm saying to myself, those are the faces of democracy. Those are the faces that the founding fathers, were they to be here today, they'd say those are the very people that we were hoping to empower in this wonderful 200 years plus system of self-governance. So I, I think it's a really important time to be accountable. Yeah, well that's great. Whenever 1,000 happens, just let us know. We'll, we'll be there for sure. Um, so, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, working across the aisle. Um, one of your colleagues recently announced um, he's going to be leaving the Senate, Senator Isaacson in Georgia. I think a lot of people outside of Georgia don't know him, but it's very striking to us, you know, we, we follow every member of Congress, every senator, how sincerely people seem to be fond of Senator Isaacson. And, and you know, it wasn't just, oh, you're supposed to say this, but do you have any thoughts? Yes, I, I, I uh... I said today after giving it a fair amount of thought that what I admire most about Johnny Isaacson is he has a real gift for lowering the decibel level, lowering the noise that accompanies so much of what goes on in Washington, and then has always said, let's try to find a way for all sides to secure their basic principles, compromise basic principles, but also to find some common ground. And what I really will always treasure with Johnny Isaacson was the work that we've been able to do together for the elderly, and particularly, and I talked about it some today, the landmark Chronic Care Act, which begins to transform the biggest federal health program from what it was primarily an acute care program to what it is now primarily an acute chronic, excuse me, a chronic care illness program. And you know the folks at Indivisible Oregon very well. Um, they asked a question uh, during the uh, during the town hall, um, and they also asked us 
um, to pass along. They're, you know, they are mobilizing and trying to motivate um, on, around this issue of filibuster. That this scenario where, you know, uh, your party takes back the White House and, and takes back the Senate by one or two votes, but then so many issues, nothing happens on election security, on climate change, on common sense gun violence, um, and they ask me to ask you your, your feelings on that. I am thinking through how various issues will play out um, with respect to having the filibuster be without, as you know, and certainly uh, viewers of community meetings know, Mitch McConnell's essentially abolished the filibuster for everything except legislative you know, business for the judicial appointments and other uh, appointments. For example, the people of Oregon voted twice to have death with dignity which would empower the individual rather than the government to make these you know, gut-wrenching decisions with respect to end of life care. House of Representatives, after Oregon voted twice on a matter that has historically been left to uh, Oregonians, House of Representatives voted to throw our votes in the trash can. I was very new in the Senate, and I said, you may think we're small, and you probably never heard of me, but if you think you're going to roll us after we voted twice on something, you have another thing coming. When the dust settled, because I made it clear that I would tie up the Senate on something that really was a core value for, for Oregon, we prevailed. So the question is, what are some of the best ways to really think this through? I thought for some time, uh, my colleague, Senator Merkley, had a very interesting idea about what he calls the talking filibuster, which was, you do get the filibuster, but only if you show up. So like Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Right, you, you yeah. can't say you're gonna filibuster and then go play golf with a bunch of lobbyists in Palm Springs. You gotta actually do it. Yeah. So I haven't really settled on uh, a path forward for the big issues, many of which will go to the, the finance committee, health care, you know, paying for climate change, trade, uh, infrastructure funding, that kind of thing. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm guessing you'll hear more about it in, uh, in town that's, halls. That's, to come. that's the whole point of town hall meetings, is to get people's ideas and input and think through the various as aspects of it. I, I commend um, these organizations that are giving you questions. That's exactly what town hall meetings are for. Cool. Uh, my last question is, so we're on the cusp of a moment where this presidential campaign is going to take up so much oxygen, so much attention, people's time, people's money. Certainly not asking you to comment on, on candidates or the election itself. But as this is happening, the business of governance goes on. What is, what is one thing you would tell Americans that as this exciting presidential race is happening, one thing they can do, should do, should focus on? Well, I mean, I, I think, first of all, I want people to understand what are the priorities between now and the end of the year. I think election security, um, reducing gun violence, and stopping prescription drug price gouging are the three big priorities between now and the end of you know 2019. Now, there will be a whole host of issues still to deal with in 2020. They will probably require um, looking at them to the greatest extent possible in a nonpartisan kind of way. For example, there's a lot of interest in the Finance Committee in a rural health care package, which could possibly pass in, uh, in 2020. But yeah, nobody underestimates the fact that um, the election is going to take a lot of the oxygen out of the road. But, but would you agree that Americans' voices calling their senator, calling the member of Congress, still going to matter absolutely. in the months ahead, ab going ab to town halls? Ab 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 absolutely. I've already made it clear that I'm looking at a very bold overhaul of the tax care sy uh, tax uh, system. You know, in America, I'm just stunned that what has come to be known as tax deferral 
basically allows the affluent to just put off, put off, put off, and put off some more, paying any taxes on their vast you know, holdings, and then a cop and a nurse, once or twice a month, has their taxes taken out of their paycheck, and there's no break you know, for them. I think we ought to have a tax system that gives everybody a chance, a chance to get ahead, and you better believe we'll be talking a lot about that at town meetings next year. Well, great. Thank you so much uh, for holding your 950th town hall. Congratulations, and thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Well, and, and, and let me uh, make it clear, I think the town hall, town hall project is really making a difference. I've noticed um, just online and, and members um, talking to each other that there's a lot more understanding that grassroots involvement, which is what town hall meetings really are all about, accountability, and grassroots and, and involvement is more and more important now than ever because of this um, polarization. I want to congratulate the town hall project for all that you all have done to make that possible. Thanks. To be continued. Very kind. Thanks. <laughs>